How many of you are sat in the same seat you've been sat in since first thing this morning? How many of you are sat next to someone that you knew before you arrived here today? Okay, before we do anything else, I am out of my comfort zone. I'm going to ask you to get out of your comfort zone. I'm going to ask you to get up right now and find a seat somewhere other than where you're sat. If you're at the back, come to the front. If you're at the front, go to the back. If you're on the left, go to the right. Find yourself next to someone new. Let's change up the energy in here. Good. How many of you hate me right now? <laughs> That's good. My job now is to make you love me. How many of you have ever experienced emotional pain so great, so deep, you would have sought any solution for that pain to end? Many of you. How many of you, when you experienced that emotional pain, actually considered a permanent solution to that temporary problem? Wow. How many of you have never experienced anything like that ever before? That's pretty much everyone then. As Pete said, my name is Neil Shah. I run an organization called the Stress Management Society, which I founded in 2003. Uh, and today I can happily say I'm happy, I'm healthy, I'm probably in the best place I've ever been in my life. I run a very successful organization, I get to make a difference. My job, what I get paid to do, I could literally do for free. I get to travel the world and make a positive difference, to contribute positively to society. And, you know, I have an amazing team, I've got wonderful friends, amazing family, I'm financially in a good place, I've got, you know, all the best things I could ever ask for in my life around me. But it wasn't always this way. When I was 24, I started my first business. And I didn't start that business because I put lots of thought into it, or because I had a business plan. I literally had a falling out with the director for the company I used to work for, which ended up with me punching him in the face. I'm not proud of that. Man. And I thought, oh, crap, what am I going to do now? I can't go back to work. So I thought, yeah, I'll start, up, I'll start my own company. Um, went to see my bank manager, because these are the days that you could actually walk into a, a bank and speak to your manager. It wasn't outsourced to a, an offshore call center. And I said to him, I'm going to start my own business. He's like, great, can I see your business plan? I was like, what are we talking about? Cash flow, profit and loss. I was like, I don't know what those things are. SWOT analysis, uh, you've got me there. He's like, what do you want from me? I was like, uh, overdraft, loan? He's like, yeah, not going to help. <coughs> Bank account, he gave me a bank account. So I started my own business. This was literally a couple of days after leaving my old job. And on the Wednesday, I started trading for, with my own company. It was an IT recruitment firm. By the Friday, my little company was making 400 pounds a day in profit. The end of the first year, made 700,000 pounds. I was 24. I was earning more money in a month than most people would make in a year. And it was great. I was having a great time. Turned it into a multi-million pound business, won the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, opened offices in lots of different countries, and it went to my head. How many of you have seen Wolf of Wall Street? I watched that film and thought, shit, they've copied my life story. <laughs> I'm not joking. That's basically pretty much what happened. Fast cars, fast lifestyle, alcohol, drugs, you name it. And the universe has a way of correcting your course when you're not serving the path that will fulfill you. And I had the rug pulled from under my feet. It was a great thing. I'm really happy that it happened. But essentially, by the time I was 26, I, as I said, I won the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. I got invited to number 10 Downing Street to have breakfast with Tony Blair. I'm not proud of that, knowing what we know about him now. <laughs> but obviously, at the time, I'm a kid, and I'm you know, getting invited with another business. They're not very well known, very, very small business. At the time, we were peers. They, they used to make smoothies. You might have heard of them. They're called uh, Innocent. So basically, I beat them in the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. But by the time I was 28, my business had gone into decline. I made some really crap decisions, like asking my best mate to be my business partner. I was so busy having a good time and enjoying how easy it was to make money, I didn't set myself up for a time when maybe it wouldn't be so easy. When the dot-com bubble burst and September 11th, 2001 happened and things changed, I wasn't really prepared for it. And we found ourselves having a bit of a tough time, which I could have resolved, but I found at that point I went into, I didn't recognize it at the time, but I went into a serious state of stress. I wasn't sleeping at night, I was angry, I was frustrated, I couldn't focus at work, I was losing weight because I'd lost my appetite, I was drinking a lot, um, I wasn't able to communicate. I hadn't really associated it with stress. I thought maybe I was ill. I went to see my doctor and he suggested antidepressants. Now, I knew enough to know that that wasn't the answer. 
Soon after that, I found out that the person I was with was cheating on me. Um, and ultimately, the business went into, I put my hand up because I couldn't cope anymore and put the business into voluntary liquidation, which resulted in me losing everything. Lost my money, car was repossessed, the, my partner left me. Most of the people I thought were my closest friends also turned their back on me. And at the lowest part of that experience, I essentially got to a point where I was in a very deep, dark valley in my life. This is the part of the story where I'd normally stop and just then go on to the good bits. The part of the story I've just started to share only very recently, I think this is the first time I'm sharing it off stage. I've shared it at interviews and in, on paper, but it's the first time I'm sharing it with a group of people. The, the depth of that experience, I swallowed a bottle of pills because I wanted to end my own life. My emotional pain was so great that I wanted it to end. Um, and I did my research as well. I made sure that the pills that I swallowed were going to do the job. Because when a man decides to kill himself, he's solution-focused, right? It's not a cry for help. But I fucked that up as well, which I'm really happy about, to be fair. And I remember coming to in hospital after having my stomach pumped and seeing my dad and my brother there being very devastated. And that was basically about the lowest you could get. And it wasn't because of what I'd done to myself, but what I'd done to the people that were left. There wasn't many people left in my life, but the people were left had suffered greatly as a result of that experience. Um, <clears throat> and that really gave me an opportunity to reflect. I did lock myself away from the world for a period of time in this deep, dark valley, thinking about how do I get myself back on top of the world? Because that's where I was used to being. It was only a couple of months before that. You know, you're on the front cover of magazines and got all the money in the world and living this wonderful lifestyle, or what I thought was a wonderful lifestyle, and now I'm in rock bottom. All I could think about is, how do I get myself back on top of the world? How do I get myself back on top of the world? So I did what any self-respecting person would do, and I went to the highest place I could think of. What's the highest place you can think of? Everest. Everest, that's what I thought as well. So, long story for another day, but in 2003, I went off to Nepal to attempt to climb Mount Everest. William Blake said, when men and mountains meet, strange things happen that don't happen when you're jostling in the street. And that's where I had my epiphany, where I realized that this experience I'd had, which at the depth of which I attempted to take my own life, was the greatest gift that I could ever have been given. And I realized that this experience had allowed me to learn something which I could use to help other people. I could do something positive with this. I did have a bit of a, a spiritual awakening. I met the spirit of the mountain, reduced me to tears on my hands and knees for a couple of days, spent a bit of time in a Buddhist monastery, long stories for another day. Um, and I thought, that's it. I'm going to do something to help other people. I'm going to do something to help people to be able to recognize when they're in a state that's not serving them and think about what they can do about it. Now, at this point, I'm still trying to figure out my own journey. My first patient, my first client was myself. And it was through that experience that I realized that actually, as much as you know, we get to that point where we're overwhelmed and we can't see the wood for the trees and we can't even consider how we get beyond the next day, let alone reinvent ourselves, I realized that actually, by learning to do that, we, we start to learn of what we're truly capable of. And one of the things I've been so massively blown away at today is the incredible people that have been standing here on this stage. Ordinary people that have accomplished extraordinary things. Now, you know, every person that stood here has got an incredible story. But most of those stories, did you notice, started with some kind of hardship, with some kind of a challenge, with some kind of a situation which potentially could have resulted in a really negative experience. Now, there's a song I was listening to the other day. You get, you know, something in your hand. You decide what you do with that. Either you feed the wolf that makes you weak, or you feed the wolf that makes you strong. The people that stood here before me today decided to use those experiences to, you, to feed the wolf that made them strong. Now, through that experience, not only did I learn how to navigate that, but I learned how I could apply that to so many other areas of my life. I took up running because people told me I shouldn't run because I snapped my cruciate ligament. I went on to run four marathons. Now, this is not about my accomplishments. I'm just trying to share with you what is possible when you change your story. And then when I got to the point where I got bored of running, I decided to take up triathlons, which in 2014 resulted in me doing the Ironman in Mexico in 35 degree heat. And if you don't know what an Ironman is, look it up, it's not fun. But again, when you start asking different questions of yourself, you get different results. 
Now, what happens is that you have this experience, and it's like, oh, crap, why is this happening to me? And then people teach you that you should practice forgiveness. When someone does something bad to you or something bad happens, practice forgiveness. I've learned that's bullshit. Do you know what? I'm sorry, I swear a lot. I swear way more than Ben does. Fuck bullshit. Uh, fuck, <laughs> fuck. I've got needs to get out of my system, and lots, lots of swearing going on. But fuck forgiveness. Practice gratitude. Next time something fucked up happens in your life, be grateful for it. Because I am here today as a direct result of all the shit that's happened in my life. And if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have these stories to tell you. I wouldn't get the opportunity to stand on stage or write books or go on TV. And I could sit here and, oh my God, I, so, I feel so bad. Why did this happen to me? Or I could actually really understand why I was given these experiences. Somebody once said to me, God gives his greatest challenges to his strongest soldiers. Now, most of you are here in this room today because you've had some kind of challenge that motivated you to want to do something about it. So you decided to buy a ticket and turn up for this event. And how many can think of at least a thousand other things that you could be doing right now rather than sitting here listening to me and the other speakers? How many actually get a little bit stressed about the fact that things need to get done outside this room that aren't getting done because you're sat here right now? <laughs> and how many get at some point over the last couple of days actually considered come up with an excuse not to attend today's program? I appreciate your honesty. When you are swimming in a fast-moving river, the hardest thing that you can do is take yourself out of the river to stand on the bank to find a better way of navigating it. And that really, for me, is what today is about. We have taken ourselves out of that river for a day to consider what is a better way of navigating it. And there's lots of people that have been standing here, myself included, that have had the opportunity to find a better way of navigating that. And that's really what I'm wanting to share with you today, is what I learned. And the bit that I learned is, what does stress actually mean? Now, Tupton did start talking about stress and the biology of stress. I'm not going to go into that in more detail. I'm going to go into how I understood stress. Because that's what allowed me to start thinking about how do I get myself beyond this? And how do I build the resilience and the capacity to cope with whatever demands life throws at me? Because I got to a point where life had thrown so many demands at me, I crumbled. And I never wanted that to happen again. So I went off looking for this definition of stress. What does stress mean? And I spoke to medical experts. This is when I first started the Stress Man Society. I spoke to medical experts at the NHS. I spoke to people in the psychology community who had their psychosocial models. I engaged with some of the universities like Roehampton in London and Harvard in the States who were doing academic studies on stress. There were people in the health and safety community in 2003 when we started the Stress Man Society. The HSC were um, about to launch the Stress Management Standards, which is kind of the, the framework on risk assessing workplace stress. And I was speaking to all these people, and none of them agreed on a common definition of stress. And I thought to myself, hold on, if the experts don't agree, how are we going to get our heads around it? And in 2004, I was invited out to uh, New York to speak at the UN. And I was on a plane, I sat next to this chap, uh, got talking to him. And most of my conversations usually start around football. I probably shouldn't mention that here, being an Englishman in Scotland. But anyway, I'll be back in June the 4th. We can have that conversation again at Hampden Park. Um, <laughs> but I got talking to him. And I said, eventually, after we stopped talking about football, I said, what do you do for a living then, mate? And he said, I'm a stress tester. I was like, wow, fascinating. What's the chance of that? I'm in stress management too. What's your background? You're a doctor, a professor, health and safety professional. He's like, what are you talking about? It's like, what do you stress test? He said, bridges, buildings, bits of metal, that kind of thing. <laughs> I was like, wow, cool, what a coincidence. I was like, so how do you define stress then, mate? And he told me. And when he told me, like, my eyes glazed over. I had no idea what he was talking about. So he could see I was a bit confused, so he scribbled his definition on a napkin. And this is what he scribbled on the napkin. He said, Neil, that's how I define stress. I was like, wow, that looks really cool. I have no idea what you're talking about. Does anyone know what that stands for? Force over area cause pressure, thank you. I still had no idea what he was talking about. So he flipped the napkin over and did a bit of a diagram to help me to understand what was going on. And that diagram was so powerful, so clear, so concise, it's ultimately what we end up building a whole organization around. And now we literally get to help millions of people and thousands of organizations based on this principle. 
And I'm going to apologize in advance for my artistic skills, even though I spent much of my youth watching Rolf Harris and Tony Hart, and none of it seems to have rubbed off. I need to change that story, don't I? <laughs> I've been using it for 15 years, and then he goes and does something to prevent me from using it. Is Tony Hart still safe, by the way? <laughs> OK. Anyway, hopefully you'll figure out what I'm drawing here. Anyone know what that is? Thank you, that's my best artistic definition of Tower Bridge. And let's say on this particular day, Transport for London have gone on strike, parked their red double-decker buses onto the bridge, filled to the top with union reps, and they're all discussing their various demands. Got a tidal surge on the Thames, and that's washed HMS Belfast onto the bridge. We've got capacity issues at both Heathrow and Gatwick, so Mayor Khan sanctions the building of a temporary runway across the top of the bridge. We've got a couple of Airbus A380s, Boeing 747s on there an escape at London Zoo. It was actually the animal rights activist. They broke down the walls. I was one of them. Uh, the elephants have all escaped and ended up on the bridge. That's an elephant, by the way. I warned you my art was bad. We've got fathers for justice have rail chained themselves to the fence. If I keep going like this and put more and more weight, more and more load, more and more demand onto that bridge, what's going to happen eventually? It's going to collapse. Do we all agree with that? doesn't matter if it's Tower Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, every bridge on the planet, if enough pressure and if enough load is applied for long enough, will ultimately collapse. We all agree with that? But before it collapses, how do we know? Creaks, bones, groans, buckles, cracks, fractures, it's given us lots of feedback that it's not coping particularly well. When it's given us that feedback, what choices do we have to prevent the bridge from collapsing? Could remove the load, or... Strengthen, shore it up, concrete blocks, iron girders underneath to better equip the bridge to bear the load effectively. Now, guess what? People are exactly the same. I don't care how mentally tough, how resilient you are, how broad your shoulders are, do we agree every single human being on the planet has an ultimate breakpoint? You put enough pressure on any human being, they too, just like a bridge, will collapse. It doesn't matter if you're a special forces soldier or you, know, you work in the local corner shop. It doesn't matter. We all have an ultimate break point. What does it look like when a human being collapses? When the human bre being's bridge breaks? From a mental and emotional perspective, firstly. And ultimately? Breakdown, would that be a fair description of a bridge collapse. What about from a physical perspective? What's the first organ in the body that experiences stress? The heart. So what do you think happens to someone that has excessive stress and pressure for extended periods of time? Heart attack. Heart attack. Number one reasons for death on the planet today, by the way, heart disease. What are the other top reasons for death? We talk about the top four reasons for death on the planet. It's heart disease is number one. Stroke. Stroke is number three. Cancer is number two. Type two diabetes is number four. So ultimately, Stress could kill you. And I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this to empower you. Because often when people have these kind of conditions, they might say, oh my God, how did this happen to me? Well, you probably put a lot of effort in for extended periods of time to create the conditions for your body to have that disease. But then the other condition is where people seek the ultimate permanent solution to a temporary problem. Now, I got to the point where I had business failure, partner cheating on me, money lost, car repossessed, lost my friends. All of that stuff got to the point where my bridge couldn't cope anymore and I decided to seek the ultimate permanent solution to the temporary problem. But actually, should I tell you the incident was the straw that broke the camel's back? And it was a really minor incident. In the biggest scheme of things, it was um, you know, my card being repossessed, everything, all that kind of stuff had happened. And then I chained my bike to the railings because I didn't have a car anymore, and I came back and someone had punctured the wheel. Like, literally, I could see something stuck in the wheel. It was a puncture, it was a minor incident. But that was the trigger experience. It, like, you might think, that's crazy. I'll well, give you another story to put this into perspective. Remember the nurse in the Kate Middleton story? The princess was pregnant with Prince George? Prank phone call from a radio presenter in Australia? What was the end result of that? She took her own life. Not because of that incident, but that's obviously what got pinned on it. If people looked at her bridge, which was never really publicized, she was a single mother, she had relationship problems before um, uh, her relationship broke down, she had financial issues, she had a period of work with depression. There was a ton of stuff on her bridge. That incident was the straw that broke the camel's back. The reason I'm telling you this is if you recognize the bowing and the buckling, the groaning and the creaking, which I didn't, 
we can take action to prevent ourselves or anyone else ever getting to the point where the bridge collapses. The reason we need to take this seriously, does anyone know what the number one reason for death in a man under the age of 45 in Britain today is? We are failing the most vulnerable members of our society. I know I've been there, and it's not easy to talk. It's not easy to ask for help, particularly as a bloke, because it's seen as a sign of weakness. And actually, I've started to realize our vulnerability and our willingness to express where we are is actually our strength. Because it's through that that we can actually start supporting each other and protecting and reaching out to those people that are being failed. And this really is what we are all about. This is what I stand for. This is why I get out of bed every morning, to be able to get people to recognize, where is their bridge? Is your bridge strong? Is it coping? Or is it starting to bow and buckle? And if so, what does that look like? Mentally, physically, emotionally? What happens to you when your bridge isn't in a good place? What could you do to alleviate the load? Now, that's not an easy one because you've got responsibilities, you've got commitments, you've got families, you've got things that you need to do. It's not easy just to chuck stuff off your bridge, but maybe you've got options to reprioritize that load, to delegate it, to ask for help, to ask for support, to say no, God forbid. No, one of the shortest words in the English language one of the hardest ones for most people to use. I'll give you a tip for nothing. No. What does no mean to you? If someone says no, what does it mean? If you ask me to do something, I say no. How would you take that response? Rejection? You don't like me. You don't, I don't, yeah, good. You don't like me. What else? Discomfort? Discomfort? Mm-hmm. Negative? Negative? Selfish. I'm selfish because I'm not helping you. It could be a sod off. It might feel like a, you know, he's telling me to sod off. He doesn't care about me. I'm going to ask you to consider no in a slightly different way. This is such an interesting word that I wrote a whole chapter on no in my book. I wrote a book called The 10-Step Stress Solution. That's one of the 10 steps, how to say no. And the simplest way of reframing the no... A negotiation opportunity. Okay, you want me to take on this new task? I just need you to understand, on my bridge right now, I've got this, this, and this going on. Here's the deadlines. Here's the consequences of not doing these activities. If you'd like me to take on this new task, what do you want me to get rid of on my bridge? Whether that's a family member, someone at work, or whoever. Oh, what you're asking me to do is a lower priority. Can I... Schedule this in and come back to this next week. They're all of equal priority. Well, I haven't got the capacity to cope with all these things. Who could either take some of the things I'm currently working on or who could take this new thing? By changing the way that we look at our bridge and what we're actually, actually able to cope with, we can find that we're a little bit kinder to ourselves. There's something Susie said to me a couple of times, is, Neil, you're too hard on yourself. And it's true, because ultimately, when our bridge collapses, we've got a cope with the consequences. But even if you can't do anything about the load itself, what we've all got the capacity to do is to develop a stronger bridge. It's to look at what can we do to better equip our bridges to cope with the ever-increasing demands of modern life. Because I started the Stress Management Site in 2003. There was no iPhone then. There was no Twitter or Facebook or all of that kind of stuff. The world has only got infinitely more stressful since then because most of you will wake up in the morning and be hit by a tsunami of information the moment you open your eyes. How many of you within literally two minutes of opening your eyes would have looked at your screens? According to research, that's about 80% of people in one society, the first thing they do in the morning is look at a screen. It's also the last thing they do at night. A University of Greenwich study has found that 38% of smartphones in Britain today have got fecal matter on them because people actually sit on the toilet checking their phones. Statistically speaking, that's a quarter of the people in this room at some point have been on the toilet checking their phones. Be careful when somebody offers you their phone to check something. You don't know what they've been doing with it. And this is the world that we live in. And I was so blown away with some of the things that Tupten was saying because I also have been exploring mindfulness. I I did three stints uh, of Vipassana. Has anyone come across Vipassana before? Basically, I lived the life of a Buddhist monk for 10 days where from half past four in the morning to nine o'clock at night, you just meditate in silence. You don't speak to anyone for 10 days and you live the life of kind of an introspective Buddhist monk. One of the most mind-blowing things I've ever done. 
But it's not about shutting yourself off for 10 days. It's how you're bringing that daily practice into your life. How do you exercise? Can you go to the gym once and be fit for the rest of your life? In the same way, you can't look at how you you know, manage your stress and increase your well-being as a one-time gig. It's how you change your life to ensure that you develop a bridge that can cope with whatever demands life throws at you. Because what is so fascinating is as your bridge gets stronger and more resilient, not only are you able to cope with the demands and challenges of life, you start asking different questions of yourself. And you start doing some of the stuff that Paula and Ben and some of the things I've done because you can, because your bridge can cope with putting more demands. And in fact, you get to the point your comfort, grows, comfort zone grows so much, you need to do more to expand it. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in 35 degree heat in Mexico doing an Ironman and thinking, how the fuck did I end up here? <laughs> because that was the only thing that I could do to continue expanding my comfort zone because it becomes a lifetime journey. I'm still considering what my next challenge is. So there's a suggestion box at the front. Feel, feel free to drop your ideas in. And that's one of the things I'm going to ask you to consider. Because when you change your bridge, the whole phrase of today's conference is change your world, changes everything. As your bridge gets stronger, guess what? You've got more capacity to contribute to the world around you. When you get on a plane, I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to finish up. When you get on a plane, and they're going through the safety instructions, and the oxygen mask drop down, what do they tell you to do before you attempt to put a mask on somebody else? What's the reason for that? You're still alive to help someone else. The amount of people that I talk to and I say, you know, at the end of the day, you need to prioritize your own needs and all that's being selfish. Who's the most important person in your life? Me. Now, that's interesting because I've asked that question to more than 100,000 people. Someone will always say me or myself. As soon as they say that, people start chuckling. And even right now, a few of you started chuckling when someone said me. Why? Why are we so uncomfortable putting our own needs first? Because guess what? When you don't, you are no, in no position to help those around you. Prioritizing your needs, looking after yourself and your bridge, let me be clear, is not selfish. It's selfless. Because the people that do that are the ones that get to contribute most. They get to make the biggest difference. And every person here that has spoken before me today would have understood that, which is why they went on to do the things they did. So that's what I'm going to ask you to consider. You are the most important person in your life. And the moment you start prioritizing that, you get to change yourself, change everything. I'm running a workshop this afternoon. Also, I keep forgetting to, to, to mention this, but we've been given goodies. I'm a brand ambassador for Rescue Remedy. I don't know if any of you have come to Rescue Remedy before, but they've given us lots of these things. So there's lots of freebies. So come and see me afterwards. We'll have a table and grab some freebies and have a chat. Thank you so much. Sunshine, when you're with me, I can fly.